good, isn't it great, just to affirm the truths of the Christian, Christian gospel. And just warms your heart, doesn't it, to, to listen and sing. Brilliant. Right, so our reading this morning is going to be from Colossians in chapter 4. It's a short reading. Um, it'll come up on the screen, so do follow it there. We're reading from Colossians 4, verses 2 to verses 6. Good. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open the door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray as I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Thank you very much, Paul. Let's pray before we look at this together, shall we? What can take that off now, can't I? Privileges of being the preacher. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words to us. We thank you for these words of of Paul to that church in Colossae. Thank you that he writes so clearly and so practically. Uh, Father, I pray that as we look at these words, you would help us by your spirit working in our hearts. Not to just hear these words, not to be mere hearers, but to be doers as you would have us be. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder what emotions you, uh, you feel when you hear the word evangelism. The word evangelism, I wonder what immediately is coming to mind and heart at that point. Meet Harry. Harry loves evangelism. He sees every conversation as a, a potential opportunity to say something about God. He'll, he'll find a way to get God into every conversation. You've ever met a Harry? Gets, gets into the office on a Monday morning. Bill says to him, did you see the Everton goal on Saturday? It was like the, the Maradona goal, hand of God. What do you think our man Harry is going to say? Oh, do you believe in God, Bill? Most of Harry's work colleagues think he's a bit weird. That's Harry. He loves a bit of evangelism. What about Harriet? Harriet, on the other hand... Not so much. Here's the word evangelism, and that sick feeling is right there in her stomach. Maybe that's what you feel when you hear the word evangelism. She wants to say something when the opportunity arises, but somehow, by the time she's worked out what she needs to say, the conversation's moved on. She lives in this permanent state of fear. In case she gets asked about her faith, mixed with a sense that she's always letting God down, now, I, I, I guess for most of us, probably we're somewhere in between those two, aren't we? Somewhere between Harry and Harriet. And it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because when you think about it, any topic that we're excited about is easy to talk about. The football fan doesn't need much prompting. The grandparents with their first grandchild dare to ask me a question about electric cars or solar panels, and as many will testify, I can assure you, you will regret it. You will regret it. You see, if we're excited about something, it's natural we want to share our experiences. So if you're joining us for the first time today, we're in the second week of a sermon series looking at All Saints' vision. Uh, it helps, it'll help massively, actually, if you do have a copy of this booklet. I think Watso held it up last week. If you don't have a copy... I'm sure we can work out a COVID-free copy to give you uh, on the way out if you'd like a copy of that. And also it's going to help massively if you can have a Bible in front of you if you're watching at home um, or in the building. So the vision, our vision, is going for growth in Christ. And it puts Jesus Christ right front and centre. It's focused on him. Last week, Watso talked about our joy in Christ. The starting point for so much in the Christian life starts with our joy in Christ, doesn't it? See, if we're not in that place, knowing the real joy in our relationship with God, feeling the weight of his divine adoption, 
You're a son or a daughter of God if you're a Christian. Do you feel the weight of that? If I'm not reflecting on his grace towards me, despite what I'm like, he knows what I'm like, but loves me anyway. If those things aren't big in my life, well then, of course, I'm not going to carry that excitement about the gospel, that excitement that will overflow in my life, not least my speech, am I? It has to be the starting point. Evangelism and joy in Christ are inextricably linked. They have to be. So we started there last week. Friends, can I say, fight for your joy in Christ. Be intentional about it. Do what you need to do to make sure that your joy in, is, is in Christ in your life. That is the starting point. Watson gave us some ideas last week. The football supporter talks about her team because she's excited about, about, about them, assuming they're doing well, that is. The grandfather talks about a granddaughter because of his deep love for her. I talk about electric cars because I'm a nerd, and also I'm passionate about the engineering. Evangelism comes first out of our joy in Christ, our excitement for the gospel, our passion for God, and our love for our family and friends. So going for growth in Christ, we summarized it as making, there we go, we're making more disciples and making mature disciples. And this week we're looking at the the first of those two tasks uh, under that heading. So the writer to the Colossians, Paul, he's coming towards the end of his letter. He's giving them some final words. And I'm dividing the reading that you just heard Paul read into two sections, okay? So the first, verses 2 to 4, talk to God about people. And verses 5 and 6, talk to people about God. So talk to God about people and talk to people about God. So let's look at the first uh, section there. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now I wonder, were you surprised by Paul's prayer request there? Did his prayer request puzzle you? Imagine for a moment, you're you're held up in some God-forsaken foreign jail, okay, in a prison cell. And you're writing to your Christian friends, your your mates in Colossae, and you're asking them to pray for doors to be opened. Now, come on, what doors are you and and I likely to be asking for them to pray that will be opened? You're in prison. It would seem to me, if you're locked up in a prison, there's one very obvious real door you might want opened, Isn't that what you'd pray for? That's where I'd be landing my prayer request. Prison doors to be opened. Not the doors Paul's bothered about, are they? Not the door he wants open. Verse 3, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. Did that surprise you as Paul read it for us? Speaks volumes, doesn't it, about priority. Want to know what gets Paul out of bed in the morning? got to be that, hasn't it? Opportunities to share his faith, his priority. He wants to share his gospel. And there's an irony there, isn't there, as well? The irony, well, the prison doors might actually be open for him if he stopped sharing the gospel. He's actually in prison for sharing the gospel. If he were to stop, the doors might actually be opened. Well, he starts by urging the the Colossians to be praying. Now, thinking of our vision, the reality is, of course, that's true for for all saints in Luz, just as much as it is for St. Ethelwaite's in Colossae. A prayerless church is one the enemy can do his best work in. This isn't just our Monday church prayer meeting at 6.30. It's our own lives, isn't it? We are the church. It's all of us, what we do daily. So he starts with prayer. Prayer is the great privilege of the Christian, isn't it? Direct access access to the living creator and sustainer of entirety. Do you think of prayer like that? That's what you have, direct access to the living God. 
Now, pretty certain, if you were offered, say, for example, a daily phone call with the Queen, or, I don't know, maybe, maybe the Queen doesn't float your boat, Bojo, if, if you like Bojo, or maybe Lewis Hamilton, or whoever your favourite VIP is, imagine you were offered a daily phone call. Now, I reckon you'd work your life around that phone call, wouldn't you? You, you would have it as such a priority that you'd make sure you planned your diary around it. Probably would be a bit of a devotion. Queen, he rings you up daily, you're going to make sure you, you're there. The God of the universe, the God of all time, the God of infinite love, infinite grace, waiting for your call. Yet how easily we let our daily call with God go to voicemail, don't we? Watchful, the reality of the spiritual battle, right there, the enemy is looking to disrupt gospel work. You're in my Christian, Christian life. He wants nothing more than your faith to go south. That's what he's trying to do. Paul urges the Colossians to pray against it. Thankful. That's actually a mark of the whole letter. And we're back to that joy in God, aren't we? We'll struggle to pray if we don't know and feel praise for for all that God has done for us and for all he is. Prayer and praise go hand in hand. So Paul asks for prayers for doors to be opened so he can proclaim Christ. In other words, he starts by talking to God about people. Now, I wonder, if if we did an inventory of what we pray for, what we'd find. I I don't know if you use a prayer diary daily or maybe use the the Prayer Mate app, which is brilliant, by the way. I'm not not getting commission. It's not sponsoring the service. But if if you've not used the Prayer Mate app, talk, talk to me afterwards. But if you were to look through those prayers, do they include prayer for opportunity to share the gospel? Do they include people who you'd like to talk to about your faith, people that don't know the Lord? Do you talk to God about people? Does it strike you that that's got to be a good starting point, hasn't it? We may think that we don't often get much chance to share our faith. But I wonder, have we thought of actually praying for opportunities on a regular basis? And the other benefit, I think, of of making it a regular prayer is that it's going to put it on our daily agenda a bit more, isn't it? If we're praying, if we're we're more likely to be intentional about something that we've also prayed about. So think about it. In the morning, you you pray for an opportunity to, to talk to your mate at work. You're more likely to be on the ball when you get into work and he says something about an item in the news or whatever it is if you've prayed about it in the morning, aren't you? Remember when we pray, we're not informing God of of things he doesn't otherwise know about. We're not twisting his arm in our favour. A part of what we're doing is reminding ourselves that we sit under his sovereignty, his divine control. That casual conversation that, that drifts into matters of faith, there's nothing casual about it. God planned it. God uh, yesterday gave me a somewhat painful but very obvious illustration of this. Now, those nearest, or maybe it's so bad that even those at the back, <clears throat> might notice that my left eyelid has been glued back together and an abundance of, of steri strips applied. This came about because I knocked a loudspeaker off a shelf onto my head. Now, this, it turns out, is somewhat suboptimal for the health of one's eyelid. And... Uh, this all happened ironically because of my passion for audio engineering, which is, which is my previous life. Ask, ask me afterwards if you want to know why I was taking a speaker off a shelf. Anyway, the gash warranted a visit to A&E, and the triage nurse asked me how come I became a vicar. Later on in my visit, the doctor gluing my eyelid asked exactly the same question. Last sentence of our reading so that you may know how to answer everyone. One thing I've never quite nailed, though, is what to say when they say to me, you don't look like a vicar. I've never worked out, what do you say next? You know, that one's a tricky one. Now, I'm not saying that that God dropped a speaker on me and gasped open my eyelid so I could share my faith with some A&E medics. But neither was it an accident or an emergency in God's office. God's head office. So if we want an opportunity to share our faith, it's not a bad idea to be praying for it. Talk to God about people. 
Which doors Paul wants prayer to open isn't the only surprise in our first two verses. His next prayer request, equally surprising, I'd say. So this is Paul, remember. Now, we owe pretty much all of our Christian doctrine to the explanation of faith in his letters. Vast ways of the New Testament, his work. The clarity and the power of his words, unquestionable, aren't they? Brilliant. We understand the foundations of the Christian faith because of the clarity of Paul's teaching. And so Paul's prayer, did you spot it? Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. I'm sorry, Paul. What was that last prayer? Have I got this right? Paul, Paul, the great apostle, you of all people want prayer for your preaching to be clearer? Wow. You ever feel, well, I'm not great at explaining my faith. I, I get it muddled. I'm not sure I'm that clear once I get started. Well, so it seems you're in good company. Paul feels just exactly the same. He's writing to his prayer partners to pray for it. It'd be easy to think, wouldn't it, that the difficulties we have in explaining our faith clearly or to think, because I'm not always ready with answers for tricky questions, easy to think that 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 might mean I, I shouldn't try. We shouldn't do it. Paul didn't decide that. Seemed to me if that's Paul's prayer... Well, then part of that talking to God about people is prayer to be better at explaining our faith to those people. Now, maybe you're thinking at this point, well, do you know what? I have a lot of sympathy with with Harriet's position. Many of us are probably thinking that. So let me offer a few practical suggestions. The first one is you could try learning a gospel outline. Now, a gospel outline is just a simple way of explaining the gospel, so that you don't miss bits out. And the best way to do it is just to learn one. <clears throat> there is a, one that we, we sometimes teach on a, a course I run, the Timothy course, and it's, it's called Two Ways to Live. I think they've changed the name more recently. Now, this isn't so that the moment someone asks you, you switch automatically into this sort of robot voice and you just recite a learned response. You know, provided you get two minutes of uninterrupted attention, you can tick the box of having dispensed the gospel perfectly. That's ridiculous. The next sentence, Paul deals with that. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. That's not wise, is it? The point of learning an outline is that in your head, you've got it clearly. You can explain the gospel clearly because you've those marker points, a framework in your head. A framework onto which you can hang natural conversation. I don't know if you've ever heard that uh, it said that um, Winston Churchill said that the best spontaneity is rehearsed. So by knowing a gospel outline, you don't have to work in your mind to think what is the gospel. It's there in your head. And you can just weave it naturally into a conversation based on what others are saying to you. Let, um, let me, let me um, try this for you. So, say, say someone says uh, of a news item, well, how can you believe in a God when a police sergeant at Croydon gets shot dead on Friday? Oh, that's a, an horrendous evil. Emotions are likely to hit us at that point. He was actually a friend of Andy Kemp behind me here. What if Andy gets thrown that question at him next time He's in work. Now, I can't imagine I could deal with that sensitively in that context unless I have the resource of clarity already in my head before I attempt to answer. A framework in my head to draw on. We know the gospel speaks right into this situation, the result of human sin, rebellion against God. Now, of course, we'd want to say in our response how much pain this causes God. We'd want to be sensitive. We might ask instead, do you want to know what God does have to say about that? Ask, because that means you're, you're then being invited to share your view. You're not forcing it on them. Do you see what I mean? So if they later say, oh, you, you just spoke at me. No, you asked them, would you like me to share? And they said, yes. So you share. 
And then we can, we can be clear. You'll do, you do better than this, but maybe something like this. Well, it's not what God designed us as humans for. Trouble is, we're not interested, by and large, in taking much notice of how God designed us to live. We want to ignore what God says about human relations in all sorts of ways. We stick two fingers up at God and make our own decisions about right and wrong. God warns us that this is exactly what we can expect if we go that way. Let me assure you, he's much more against evil than you and I. It's exactly what God says he hates. It's exactly why he sent his son to die for us. Now, in a real conversation, I'd suggest taking more time and going more gently, particularly on something as sensitive as as that. But because of a framework in our heads of the gospel, we know it talks of our rebellion against God, the resultant world we live in with the consequences, which then connects to the news item. We can speak into it and take the conversation on from accusation. We can move off the back foot. So that's my first suggestion. Learn an outline so you can plug into it at any point from a real-life conversation. If you want to know how to do that, just come and see me afterwards. I can point you to a way to do that. And the second thing I think I want to say is, do you note the pronouns in this passage are plural? Let me go back. What happens if I go back? We may proclaim our message. See, the church as a whole... We don't have to be the gospel preachers. If you don't think you can explain the gospel, well, you don't have to. Be the friend. Love the person. Be in their lives so that that when a candlelit carol service or an Easter service or a men's breakfast, whatever it might be, Christianity Explored is starting, all you need to do is bring them. The invitation is natural. It's not out the blue because you're sharing your life with them. Bring them and let someone else do the explaining of the mystery of Christ. We don't all have to be evangelists, but we can all be friends, can't we? And actually, that distinction is here in in the verses, in fact. Three verses. It's all about Paul, the preacher, prayers for his proclamation. But then there's a shift of emphasis when it comes to the Colossian Christians he's writing to. So we've got, talk to God about people, verses two to four. Talk to people about God, Verses 5 to 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Compare that final phrase in each half of this section, and the distinction is clear. Paul, what's he to do? He's to proclaim Christ. The Colossians... Theirs is conversation. Theirs is a a response to questions. Do you see the difference? One is is proclamation. The other is a kind of responsive evangelism. Paul the evangelist looking for opportunities to proclaim direct evangelism. The typical Christian in Colossae, well, they're on the lookout instead for opportunities for a kind of responsive evangelism. That's got to be helpful for us, hasn't it? God's not expecting you to go into your school, your office, your warehouse, stick a box on the floor, stand on it and start preaching. Maybe too many Harrys have done that, been too eager to force conversation unnaturally, to shoehorn in Jesus all too often. Is that wise? Probably not. But it's also not a call to retreat like a Harrier and never say a word. I think I understand the be wise in the way you act to mean a degree of intentionality about evangelism. In other words, if I'm going to be wise, I'm going to to read a social context, a conversation. I'm going to be gracious and not brash. I'm going to get myself prepared, be deliberate. I'm going to hear the news items as I drive to work, as I drive to the supermarket. And I'm not inert. I don't just absorb the news. I'm going to try and relate it to my faith. I'm going to think, well, how does my faith respond to that? How does the not yet Christian think about this? What does my faith say into this? Being wise is going to take intentionality to be prepared. So I'll be full of grace. So my answer will have some weight to it. 
it'll be seasoned with salt, because I've already done a bit of thinking. When I arrive at work and someone says, what do you think about that? It's not just, boom, a surprise. I've given it thought. But that takes intentionality, doesn't it? Being wise is going to take that. And that will help us to know how to answer everyone. I found this book really helpful on this topic. It's called uh, Questioning Evangelism. And he talks of how by asking questions instead of making statements, we can open up a conversation to go further. Questions work better to disarm the kind of hostile questioner. Questions can help to, to move someone from, from sort of thinking in their minds of they're against what you're about to considering it. It's less of a sparring match and, and maybe more of a genuine conversation. He gives an example of a, a hostile interrogator who seemed more interested in kind of belittling him in front of a crowd than a genuine question. Have you ever been there? I can think of a number of works Christmas socials where the after-dinner sport was uh, grilling Pricey the Christian. Uh, and they're all slightly drunk, aren't they? So really, you know, it's probably a waste of time, but you do your best. Well, he t talks of the need uh, uh, for saltiness and grace. So saltiness has a degree of bite if the, the approach is hostile, but graciously done. Now, I'm not saying this is perfect, but let me read you uh, one example that he gives so you can get the gist of it. So this is that situation of a hostile person sort of making an attack for, to score points in a, in a group. So I suppose you think all those sincere followers of other religions are going to hell, do you? He replies, do you believe in hell? He appeared as if he had never seriously considered the possibility. He looked so puzzled, perhaps because he was being challenged, when he thought that he was doing the challenging. After a long silence, he said, no. I don't believe in hell. I think it's ridiculous. Echoing his word choice, I said, well, then why are you asking me such a ridiculous question? So that's quite edgy, isn't it? But it's using his words. I wasn't trying to be a wise guy. I simply wanted to be honest, examine the assumptions behind his own question. His face indicated that I had a good point and that he was considering the issues of judgment, eternal damnation, and God's righteousness for the first time in his life. The silence was broken by another questioner who chimed in, well, I do believe in hell. Do you think everyone who disagrees with you is going there? I asked, do you think anyone goes there? Is Hitler in hell? He's put brackets, Hitler has turned out to be a helpful, if unlikely, ally in such discussions. Of course Hitler's in hell. How do you think God decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Does he grade on a curve? From there, the discussion became civil for the first time and serious interaction about God's holiness, people's sinfulness, and Jesus' atoning work ensued. Like I say, it's not perfect, but it gives you an example, doesn't it, of how we might, might approach that kind of thing. I, I wonder if you can think back of situations where you've been on the back foot and have been firing back statements in response where, in fact listening to what they're saying and asking a few questions first might have diffused the approach, led to a more authentic and useful conversation. Maybe in conversation this is more difficult as you, you have to think quite quickly, but I wonder how often you're interacting on social media. I wonder how often there are posts, Instagram, Facebook, that if we thought carefully could in some small way be an opportunity for, for a well-placed question. We've much more time then, haven't we, to work on that pithy but gracious question. One evangelist I once heard, Michael Green, said, a way to see how uh, we start out in evangelism with someone is, is to see it as if you're putting a stone in their shoe. Get the idea? So you put a stone in the shell so that they're hobbling along. In other words, the question challenges their assumptions or somehow shows that perhaps their worldview that they think is so sewn up and yours is so hopeless, in fact isn't. In fact, has its holes. It's not to try and be the wise guy. That's not gracious. But it's not the insipid option either. It's got a bit of salt to it. It takes practice, and I'm afraid will be learnt through painful mistakes. You just have to try. One very practical thing you could work towards is this. When we finish this series on the church vision, we've taken the decision to run an online Christianity Explored course. 
by using our online services to deliver each of the seven Christianity Explored talks. Now, the thinking behind this is that it's a lot easier for people to click online and watch a talk. That's easier. That's an easier invite, perhaps, than bringing them along to an actual live course. So here's how it could work. This is what, what you could try. Maybe you've a friend, a neighbor, a family member who you've had some conversation about your faith. Could you, over the next few weeks, suggest looking at the basics of Christianity together? And then get hold of the Christianity Explored. This doesn't seem to be advancing at all anymore, Tim. There's a, there's a, I'm gonna, somewhere, if you get to the, uh, the link with the Good Book Company, that'll be helpful. So get hold of the Christianity Explored participants booklet and a Mark's Gospel for them, and maybe the leader's booklet for you. And then once you've got them, perhaps, I don't know if you can meet up with that person or, or perhaps arrange a time during the week to meet up and do the kind of homework section, the little Bible study with them, either virtually or, or by meeting up. And then you can, you can give them the link to the Sunday service. So you can say, well, look, we've done that little study. If you just link to that, on Sunday, you can watch the talk that it mentions in the book, and they'll be able to hear us deliver the talk. We'll try and put the talks right up front in the service, so if they don't want to stay to the end, they don't have to, but hopefully they will. This could be a really exciting way, couldn't it, to realize both parts of this text. We'll do the talks, you do the conversations. It makes use of the fact that we're online, that COVID has meant that we have to broadcast our services. Well, let's use it. Let's make use of that. Maybe you've not got someone to do it with, but you yourself would like to give it a go anyway, a kind of refresher of the basics of the Christian faith. Get your own copy of the booklet and join in. In the, in the vision booklet, I share, I, I make the point that the church was formed out of the proclamation of the gospel and was purposed for the proclamation of the gospel. At the end of the day, it's why we're here. If our faith was only about our personal salvation, God would whisk us off, wouldn't he, at our conversion to our eternal home. He doesn't do that. Instead, he leaves us with a job to do. It's our privilege to be his ambassadors to a world that desperately, desperately needs God, real hope. We're programmed by God to seek joy. Those around us seek joy. But of course, the reality is the only real lasting joy is found in the Lord Jesus. Anything other than rooting our joy in Christ will ultimately leak out, ultimately prove inadequate. The joy of Christ comes from the reality that, that the Christian is a forgiven sinner, loved, rescued, adopted as a son of or a daughter of the living God. Ask me a small question about our electric car, and my enthusiasm will be obvious within seconds. Friends, as we work towards planting a new church, we're going to need to be those who, when we're asked a, a, a small question about our faith, we'll be those whose enthusiasm for Jesus Christ will be obvious within seconds. What changes do you need to make to your life? to be that person.